so let's go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome to the introduction to ROAR webinar. Thank you very much for being here today. So in today's webinar, we will provide an overview of the basics of what ROAR is and why it came to be. And we will do a walkthrough of the basic components of the registry and provide examples of how ROAR IDs are being used. We'll close with some information about how you can get involved in ROAR and stay up to date on the project. We will have ample time at the end for questions, but please feel free to post them in the Q&A box as they come up during the talk and we'll try to address them in the course of the discussion and the rest will handle at the end. The webinar today is being recorded and we will circulate the recording to all of you afterward as well. So first I'd like to briefly introduce myself. I am Maria Gould. I am the ROAR project lead and I work on identifier services at the California Digital Library, which is one of the steering organizations behind ROAR. Also on the webinar today, working behind the scenes, we have some members of the ROAR outreach team who are going to be helping monitor questions and chat. So before we go further, we're also a little curious to know who is calling in today. So we're going to do a quick poll just to get a sense of where everyone is located, the type of organization you represent, and what brings you here today. Why are you interested in ROAR? So I'm going to launch a poll and you should see it coming up on your screen in just a moment. The poll is ending. I'm going to share the results and it's great to see a really good mix of participants here today from different parts of the world and different types of organizations. Also great to see many of you are passionate about identifiers and uh, also about integrating ROAR in your systems and in addition to, to other reasons for, for joining today. So I'm really happy to have everyone here and excited to tell you all about ROAR. So now let's talk about ROAR. Uh, first, I want to define what we mean when we talk about ROAR. So ROAR stands for the Research Organization Registry, and it is a community-led project to develop an open, sustainable, usable, and unique identifier for every research organization in the world. And I'm going to highlight some key points from that description. First, ROAR is infrastructure. It is an open registry of persistent identifiers and metadata for research organizations. And second, ROAR is focused on research organization affiliations, a really key piece of metadata that can be used to connect research outputs to institutions. So this is a really important distinction because it means that ROAR has a different focus and scope than say trying to encompass every single department at every single institution, for instance, or focusing on identifying every single legal entity in the world. And lastly, one thing that sets for our part is that it's a community led project. Our focus is on developing open data and infrastructure for and with the scholarly research community. So that means libraries, institutions, research administrators, publishers, funders, repositories, and more. ROAR officially launched in 2019, so it's been around for a little over a year now, but it has its origins all the way back in 2016 through a collaboration between 17 different organizations who all had an interest in building this kind of infrastructure. The project is currently led by California Digital Library, Crossref, and Datasite, with five other organizations functioning as part of a steering group for ROAR, including Digital Science, which, which contributed the seed data that we used to launch the registry. We also have about 45 or so members of a broader community advisory group for ROAR, which anyone is welcome to join, and I'll come back to that point a little later on. So now let's talk a little bit about why and how ROAR came to be. When those 17 organizations started collaborating back in 2016, what were they trying to do? So ROAR emerged really to solve a specific problem or a cluster of problems. In the world of scholarship, as many of you will know, it is really important to be able to search and discover and access and cite research. And it is 
Likewise, important to be able to find what you need and also have the assurance that your searches are providing a complete set of results. With online scholarship, persistent identifiers are a key part of the infrastructure that we use and need to search and discover and access and cite research. And these identifiers are a key part of how we tie different parts of the research landscape together. For example, if we want to be able to track all of the research products from a particular researcher. So before ROAR emerged, we had already had some identifiers that helped with this, with this puzzle well, the, um, that could be used to make these connections. Many of you will be familiar with ORCID identifiers that can identify researchers and di disambiguate individuals who might have the same name. And many of you have probably seen digital object identifiers or DOIs used to link to an online article or data set. And with ORCIDs and DOIs, you can efficiently query scholarly metadata to see all of the articles by a particular researcher, for instance. But what if you wanted to see all of the articles by researchers affiliated with a specific institution? And that's the piece that really has been missing. And you can really only go so far with it, get so far with identifiers for researchers and research, uh, um, research outputs without having this affiliation piece. And so this affiliation piece has long been a missing, a missing part of the puzzle um, of how we tie all of these things together. And specifically what's been missing is the ability to do this with an open identifier as opposed to a proprietary or commercial one. So just to give an example of, of what that missing piece might look like and the problems that can result from it, um, here is an example of four different articles, uh, all published by researchers at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA in various journals. And if you look closely at these articles, you can see that in each of them, the name of the school is written in a slightly different way. Now, this isn't necessarily a huge problem if you're a human scanning these affiliations and you can more or less, uh, more or less guess that, that these all refer to the same institution, but a, uh, a machine trying to, uh, trying to compute this might not necessarily make the same connections. And so this type of variation in free text affiliations makes it really hard to get a complete picture of research outputs affiliated with a specific institution. However, with a standard globally unique identifier like ROAR used instead, all of those different variants of the name <laughs> can roll up to this unique ROAR ID in this case. And so this is the ROAR ID for the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. So when we have ROAR IDs fitting into this puzzle, we can really connect all of these pieces together. So I'd like to go back quickly to this question of why, why ROAR emerged. And you may have already heard, I would imagine, of other identifiers for organizations like GRID or ISNI or Ringgold or maybe a national level identifier or a library focused one. So you might be wondering, why do we need something like ROAR also? And the answer is because ROAR is really filling a need that hasn't yet been met by other types of similar identifiers. Uh, and this is for the reasons that I mentioned earlier on in the presentation. ROAR is completely open, uh, open data, open infrastructure, open API. ROAR is specifically focused on identifying the affiliation piece um, of this puzzle, as opposed to legal entities, for instance, or uh, all types of units within a given organization. And lastly, ROAR is being developed as a community project specifically to meet the needs of the research and library communities. But that being said, it's really important to understand that ROAR is not necessarily trying to, uh, to reproduce or duplicate these other types of identifiers that may be out there. So it's very important that ROAR can be interoperable with other types of identifiers. And I'll show you what that can look like in a moment. Uh, and another key piece of this is how ROAR fits into the broader puzzle of research infrastructure. For instance, ROAR is really designed to be easily implemented into any scholarly system uh, and able to be deposited and searched in scholarly indexes like Crossref and Datacite. So the bottom line is that the other identifiers that are out there haven't met that set of needs, um, either because they're proprietary or their scope is different or because they're not being developed as community projects. So that in a nutshell is why and how ROAR came to be. 
So now I'd like to take you on a brief tour of the registry and its core components. There are a few different ways to see what is in the registry right now. And one way to do that is through a simple search on the ROAR website. And you can do this while I'm talking if you're on a computer or a mobile device, uh, go to roar.org search. So there are about 99,000 organizations in the registry right now. In this example, I'm showing the result of a search for my organization, California Digital Library. So one um, thing to, to remember to keep in mind about the scope of ROAR um, is that, as you'll recall, we're focused on capturing affiliation level uh, identifiers for organizations. So ROAR is essentially a top level registry. We're not mapping individual hierarchies because we're really trying to solve this problem of how we connect affiliations to outputs. Now, I imagine that some of you might be wondering right now how an organization gets into ROAR or added to ROAR. Uh, and there are a couple of key things to know about this. So first, uh, as mentioned, we started the ROAR registry with seed data from GRID, and we started assigning ROAR IDs um, to organizations that, that GRID had previously collected. And since launching the registry, we have been working with GRID to manage and coordinate additions and changes. So anyone can contact ROAR right now with a request to add a new organization or make a correction to an existing record, and we coordinate those updates with GRID. Uh, longer term, what we're working on right now is building comprehensive and community-based infrastructure on top of this so that we can make changes independently in ROAR and curate the registry with community input. So continuing on with our tour, another way to search and filter organizations in the registry is through ROAR's open API. And we also have a public data dump that's available so you can download the entirety of the data set as a JSON file if you prefer to work with it in bulk. So going back to the ROAR record that I showed in this case for California Digital Library, I'm going to highlight a few things in the record. Uh, the first thing that I'll point out that's circled here is the ROAR ID. This is a URL that will always resolve to the organization record. And the ROAR ID is an opaque string that supports long-term persistence. Um, this string starts with a leading zero followed by six characters and a checksum. In addition to the ROAR ID, we have other metadata about each organization in the registry. So this includes the organization name. We have names in other languages, including support for uh, multiple character sets. We can have acronyms, the organization URL, and the location. So as part of the work to build ROAR on top of the seed file from GRID, uh, we started with a basic set of metadata from GRID and we're working now to incorporate a few additional metadata fields that ROAR didn't initially launch with that are available in GRID right now, such as some basic parent-child and sibling relationships, not necessarily going into the department level as I've explained, but being able to associate related institutions at that top level. Uh, and we're also going to be bringing in some additional more granular location data uh, like city and region. So another thing to point out in the record is that we are also mapping to other identifiers for the organization when these ex exist. And this interoperability is really important for ROAR to be widely adopted and used and to support crosswalks between different types of identifiers. So ROAR maps to GRID, uh, as you can see here, uh, as well as to ISNI, to Wikidata, the Crossref Re Funder Registry, and a few others. Uh, this, in this example, you don't see the Crossref Funder Registry because CDL is not a funder. We also have some tools available to facilitate working with ROAR data in the registry and cleaning up affiliation data. So right here, I'm showing that we have a ROAR reconciler that works with OpenRefine that can be used to clean up messy data sets with affiliation strings and map them to ROAR IDs so you end up with a clean and disambiguated list of institutions. 
we have an affiliation matching function in the Roar API that allows you to feed it a free text affiliation string and have it match to the corresponding Roar ID. So this is something that a number of Roar users have asked about because they might have a large amount of legacy content that has affiliation strings and they want to retroactively map those affiliations to consistent Roar IDs instead. So this is a quick illustration of how that might work. And I should mention that all of the code and documentation for these tools and for the Roar uh, API is available on the Roar GitHub and we'll have links available uh, toward the end. So now that we've done a walkthrough of the registry itself, let's turn to a quick example of how Roar can work in practice. So I want to emphasize that Roar is really not going to be useful on its own. The idea is for Roar IDs to be implemented in various systems and captured in research metadata so that we can achieve that, that complete puzzle, that complete picture uh, like we were talking about in the beginning of this webinar. So one way to understand Roar in action is through an example for data publishing. In this case, I'm going to be using the example of Dryad. So Dryad relaunched its platform last year and built an integration with Roar to collect institutional affiliations for researchers submitting data sets. So this means that when researchers submit a data set to Dryad and they're asked to provide an affiliation, the affiliation lookup field that you see here in the animation is actually making a call to the Roar API to find a corresponding match in Roar based on what the researcher is typing. And then the researcher can choose the appropriate affiliation from the list of options that is presented. So the researcher doesn't even have to know that Roar is operating in the background, but it allows Dryad to collect standardized affiliations from a controlled list. And then Dryad can store those Roar IDs for those affiliations in its database. And then when Dryad sends its metadata to data site, the Roar IDs can be included in that deposit as well. So you can see here how the Roar ID is showing up in data site XML. And data site has added support for Roar in its metadata schema, as well as in its discovery tools. So that makes it easy uh, to search research in data site by specific affiliations. So what I'm showing here is the public search interface in data site that anyone can use to look up research. Uh, in this case, I'm um, filtering on research associated with Queens University Belfast. And now one of the goals in Roar, as I've mentioned, is really to be able to, to connect to other identifiers like the puzzle that we saw earlier. And this is already beginning to happen. For instance, here I'm showing a visualization in the Data Site Commons Discovery Service, which is a tool that brings together DOIs and ORCIDs and Roar and other identifiers to really be able to connect all of these all of these things in one in one place. So in this example, showing um, visualization of research outputs and activity associated with UCLA. So that was an example of a typical data publishing workflow, but um, that's really something that we can see being adapted more broadly uh, in other types of research workflows today. Uh, for instance, we are doing a lot of work right now with publisher outreach and publisher adoption to explore how Roar IDs can be uh, a really core part of publishing workflows in various ways. Uh, and this is especially true as the Crossref metadata schema is soon going to be updated to include support for Roar IDs. So if we think about how Roar can be, can be useful in a publishing workflow, researchers submitting an article when they're asked to provide an affiliation in say the manuscript tracking system, uh, that affiliation can be tied to a Roar ID instead of uh, a free text string or, or another identifier. And the Roar ID can also be a useful part of, of the peer review and editorial process. For instance, checking to uh, see if a researcher has any competing interests by seeing if the researcher and a reviewer or editor share the same affiliation, for instance, and then ruling out uh, any who do. Uh, when the paper is accepted, the Roar ID can be displayed with the author information in the article metadata when it is published online. 
And then when the publisher deposits metadata in an index like Crossref, it can include the ROAR ID in that deposit. So anyone will be able to search Crossref metadata to find articles associated with a specific affiliation. So the ROAR ID will be available in the Crossref API um, so that tools and service providers can access that information and harvest it. And downstream, there are even more ways in which ROAR IDs can be useful in publishing related workflows. For instance, they can be helpful with publishers needing to identify authors and, uh, and their institutions in order to ensure accurate billing, um, to help with APC waivers, with funder compliance, with reporting to institutions on research activities, and special publishing arrangements as part of transformative agreements with libraries. And ROAR IDs can also be a valuable piece of data to help inform library licensing negoti negotiations with publishers, for instance, to understand how many authors are publishing with a specific journal or with a specific publisher as part of making collection spending decisions. And the ability to search in places like Crossref metadata can provide institutions with really powerful data and insights that can help with research administration and with reporting uh, and outreach on campuses. So th these are just some of the ways in which we see ROAR IDs being a really beneficial piece of data that can feed into uh, this ongoing need to, to better track research activities. So in addition to some of the integration examples that I just talked about, I just wanted to mention that there are a number of other implementations of ROAR that have been completed or are already in progress since ROAR's launch last year. So this list shows the integrations that we know about. Uh, there may be more. If you yourself uh, are working on one integration and it's not captured in this list, you can uh, please, please let me know. We're keeping track on the ROAR website uh, and trying to keep a running list and linking out to different example implementations. So please get in touch if, if you're working on something and it's not captured here. And broad adoption is really going to be key to ROAR's growth and success in the coming years. So we're trying to really explore the full spectrum of how ROAR can be integrated in various systems and workflows. So I'd like to close this portion of the webinar by reiterating that ROAR is a community driven effort truly and there are many different ways to get involved and stay up to date. And I want to encourage everyone here to take advantage of those options. So I hope that this webinar serves as an invitation and a word of encouragement to do so. One of the best ways to be involved in ROAR is to join our community advisory group. We meet for bi-monthly calls to discuss project updates and hear feedback. And we have some, some uh, smaller working groups operating in parallel as well on specific topics. For instance, we have a group that's focused on publisher adoption. For the past couple of years, we have been able to hold in-person community meetings co-located with Pitapalooza, where we all roar together. <laughs> Obviously, our events and outreach are focused on virtual interactions these days, um, but it also means that we have the option now to include a wider range of people in these conversations. So if you're interested in joining the community group, uh, please get in touch. Just to give you a snapshot of where different members of our community group come from. Uh, this is a, a quick global view of members locations from all over the world, always looking to incorporate more. And uh, just a general graphic, I realize the text may be a little small to see and I apologize for that but a graphic of the different types of organizations that are represented in the ROAR community group, which I think speaks to the wide range of applications and benefits that ROAR has for many types of stakeholders. I'd like to also emphasize again that as a community effort, uh, we're really looking to the broader community of, of ROAR stakeholders to, to help drive further adoption and, and support for ROAR. So uh, if you are interested in, in getting involved or working on Adoption and integrations is a really is a really good way to do that. So we have an adoption working group. Uh, we also have 
Uh, there's a side project that's happening to develop a ROAR plugin in OJS that we, uh, that I know that's, is they're looking for additional contributors on that project. So that's something that uh, anyone can get involved in. Um, another way to support ROAR is um, if you are uh, managing a system or a workflow that does tie into the collection of ROAR IDs, um, to send those ROAR IDs to data site and Crossref so that that metadata can be publicly available. Um, and similarly, if you uh, are managing some sort of workflow, but don't necessarily uh, run the service or system yourself, you can encourage service providers to integrate ROAR in those systems. So these are just some examples of ways to help drive support for ROAR adoption and integration more widely. You can also help to curate the ROAR registry. We are starting to build a comprehensive and community-based curation model for ROAR. Uh, one of the starting points is just having a basic form that anyone can use to submit requests to add organizations or update the metadata for an existing organization. So uh, if you can think of an organization that's not already in ROAR that you think should be there, we would like to know that. And uh, also like to know if there's any metadata that needs to be updated. And there are a number of general ways to just uh, simply stay on top of project news and updates if you're not already doing so. So we have a ROAR website and a blog where we publish updates on the ROAR blog. We have an open Slack workspace that anyone is welcome to join to take part in conversations. We uh, have ROAR code and uh, documentation available on GitHub and you're welcome to check that out and post issues as well. Uh, and also sharing updates on Twitter. We have a ROAR mailing list and everyone who's signed up for the webinar will be uh, added to the mailing list by virtue of, of, of signing up. Um, of course, you can opt out, um, but there are many different ways to stay up to date on what's happening with ROAR. So that concludes the presentation portion of this webinar. I really appreciate everyone's attention and interest. And I'm really eager to see what kinds of questions and thoughts have come up. So I'm going to pause for a moment and take a look at the Q&A uh, Q box and see what's there. And then we'll have some time to go through your questions. All right, so I'm starting with the chat box. I'm going to look at what's here. For some reason, I'm not able to see the Q&A. So wondering if Rachel or Paul could help with that, but I'm going to start um, just by calling out a few comments here in the chat box that I'm seeing. And it looks like there have been a number of links popped in to help point people to the right information, which is great. Thank you very much. A comment about the reconciler, that's great that you like it. Uh, and then a really great suggestion that I wanted to mention here about a curation function on the API would be nice to auto submit non existing affiliations to ROAR instead of filling the form manually. I think that's a great suggestion. I really appreciate that feedback. I think that would be a really great feature to implement. Um, so we're at the beginning of this process right now to build this curation infrastructure into ROAR. So that's definitely something that we'll be scoping out as part of that effort. Really appreciate your bringing that up. So let's see about the Q&A here. Yeah, do you want us to, well, there's, there are a couple of questions in there, we can just read them out. Sure, yeah, for some reason, it's just not popping up on the screen. <laughs> Who knows, the, the wonders yeah. of Zoom. Um, <laughs> so one question is, and is 
what is an organization or institution um, and I think this just comes from the example that was for the medical school at UC, UCLA mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. Sherry saying that she would have assumed that UCLA was the organization and the medical school was part of the, the larger organization mm -hmm. and we've had a, a few conversations about like sub levels and stuff just in the Q&A as well. Yeah, so that's a really that's a really great suggestion and and thanks for pointing that out, Sherry. So the basic definition of organization that Roar has been has been advancing is this notion of any organization that that touches research, whether that's producing uh, funding, employing researchers, uh, disseminating research. So there are various different ways to essentially qualify as a research organization. What we are starting with right now uh, is the, the way in which that classification has essentially played out, uh, played out in the grid seed data. And so one of grids policies has been to map the medical schools separately from the primary organization, for instance. Uh, but that's not the case for like a law school, um, business school, for instance, those um, those are rolling up to the primary affiliation for the institution right now. So this is really a question that we want to explore with community input to really understand this notion of does it, you know, what are what are the what are the really important needs and use cases, for example, to have a medical school uh, be captured separately? Uh, what would that mean in the case of, you know, law schools and business schools? Would that mean that we would want to follow the same approach with those? So this is something, you know, it, it's not something that I that I have <laughs> have the answer to um, because it's something that we're really trying to develop with with this community-based curation process to understand the right approach going forward. So I hope that addresses that point. And I thank you for bringing that up because it's really, um, it's a really good one. Okay, and the, another question is, um, is there any annotation with schema.org properties? Um, Nick saying I, he thinks it would make sense to map to schema.org forward slash organization and its subtypes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. That's not something that, that uh, as far as I know, <laughs> uh, we're currently doing with Roar, but uh, it's definitely something that would be good to, to explore. And I'd be you know, curious to know if anyone uh, is, is working on that or to what extent that might all, already be possible to do. So if there are any further thoughts on that, um, happy to happy to see any follow up notes or thoughts in the chat or we can follow up offline as well. And I think just the um, the the other question in the in the Q&A is um, is is there any way to know how many entities in Roar are institutions outside the US? Yes, there are different ways to filter the API. So one of those ways is to filter by country. Uh, so that, you know, that doesn't necessarily, there, there's not necessarily a filter for US versus non-US organizations, but there is a, there is a, um, a country filter in the API so you can look it up uh, in using that tool. Um, Roar is also mapped into Wikidata. So just wanted to mention that um, because I know that Wikidata has also been building some interesting tools that show visualizations of Roar across, um, across the globe. So um, there might be a link that I can share as a follow-up that helps um, helps with that kind of high level view of where the Roar organizations are. But I would say with um, 99,000 organizations, I think the registry does have pretty good coverage uh, and continuing to add more on a regular basis. So if anyone has any further thoughts or questions or feedback, please uh, feel free to take a moment to add that to the Q&A box or the chat box. Those are the... Uh, 
All right. So I think that concludes the webinar for today. I really appreciate everyone taking the time to join and to share your questions and feedback. Please stay in touch. You can email info at roar.org at any time if you have questions or further thoughts. And if you're interested to join the community group as well to stay more involved on a regular basis, I would encourage you to do so. We will um, look to do uh, another type of webinar like this about six months from now. So um, tell all your friends and um, thank you again for being here. I really appreciate it.